Welcome to Cryptocurrencies, the Rise of Digital Money Show. And I think everyone who is listening to today's program will gain tremendous value from it. Trace Mayer, who is not only a brilliant investor, a great entrepreneur, and a successful blogger, uh, is with us, but he's also an honest man. And he has no fluff, no bullshit to offer at any time. Uh, every time I spoke with him, it's just straight talk. And Trace has been on the show before in 2017 when Wealth Research Group was one of the original newsletters to cover cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin at $400 a coin and Ethereum at $12 a coin, Monero at $19, Steam at $0.22, cents, Dash at $30, Litecoin at $26, Ripple at the end of the year at $0.27. Cents. All these prices were record lows uh, and still represents extreme value compared with today today's prices. Well, Trace was there when Bitcoin was much, much, much lower. Trace, welcome to the show, sir. Oh, glad to be here. For anyone who isn't familiar with your first encounter with Bitcoin and your journey with this, could you share this with the listeners because it brings up such important lessons? Uh, yeah, I mean, not for being too ba vague, but I kind of just came across it on the Internet. And then after a while, uh, I decided, you know what, I think I will start publicly talking about this because I'd already been a successful blogger uh, reaching millions of people with my Run to Gold blog where I talked about monetary science and the role of sound money. And so I was, you know, about a quarter. Bitcoin was around a quarter. I started uh, kind of talking about that and really helping the sound money niche understand Bitcoin and the role of digital scarcity, you know, this difficulty adjustment algorithm that makes Bitcoin the hardest money in the world uh, and really lays the foundation for that first network of spec effect of uh, speculation. Now, so and that, that's incredible, the quarter. Um, it, it brings up so many important questions with regards to it, but I want to start off with what is the, the Lightning Network? What's its current status, and how important is it for the future of Bitcoin? Yeah, so the Bitcoin's an internet protocol. One application is money or currency. Well, money and currency are different things, actually, too. And Lightning Network is a second layer. Uh, it's a it's a protocol in its own right, also. For example, Lightning Network can run on Litecoin or some of these other ones, uh, assuming they have the technological underpinnings that are needed for it, unlike Bitcoin Cash. <laughs> um, but anyways, Lightning Network, I think we're up to 12,000 12, channels. We have like 5,000 nodes running, something like that. And what we do with Lightning Network is we have creative double-entry bookkeeping that settles into Bitcoin, which is triple entry bookkeeping and the first practical implementation of that in the world. And it allows us to trustlessly send millions and millions of payments per second in a decentralized distributed way, trustless, like I said. Uh, and so it really can become the currency layer for Bitcoin. If, if the money layer, if the internet protocol, if the hard money, if that layer, you have to have security at all at all costs but the second layer where you want it to be able to function in day-to-day -day usage and additional applications like high frequency trading or gambling or whatever that will take place on this second layer and what's nice about that is you can contain the risk to just that second layer and not uh, risk anything at the base layer and also, Bitcoin can extensify in multiple different ways like this. You can have side chains, you can have Lightning Network, you could have uh, lots of different ways to extensify it, multiple levels up. For example, we could have Chami and eCash servers on top of Lightning Network that's then on top of Bitcoin. And so this really shows that you've got Bitcoin that's limited in amount and censorship resistant, you know, as the base layer, and then also extensible. And so, you know, a gold coin, a gold, piece of gold a thousand years ago is the same as a piece of gold today. You can't extensify it. That's a software term. You can't extend it. You can't create new software that it gives it new features. Because that's why we like gold is because it's defined in chemical law, but it's not extensible. But with Bitcoin, we get limited in amountance. We get 
extensibility and we can have decentralized, de uh, distributed, censorship resistant uh, base layer. And that gives us qualities to being money and currency and so much more that is just unrivaled by any other competitor in the marketplace, whether it's gold, whether it's dollars or any other fiat currencies, uh, et cetera. That's an important point. And with that in mind, let me ask you about Bucket, uh, B A double K T, uh, Bucket, the the new custodian services that are going to be implemented soon. How important of a development is it? And can you explain to people exactly what that means? Uh, well, Bact is uh, owned by the guys that own New York Stock Exchange, ICE. Uh, I mean, th these are the these are the 800 pound gorillas. They run the largest commodity markets in the world. I mean. It doesn't get any bigger than this. And what I think they're looking at is, one, they're going to be providing a warehousing solution. Uh, they've asserted that they're going to vault, like vault Bitcoin itself and not have any fractional reserving going on or stuff like that. And then they're going to have exchanges also. And these exchanges will start with a next day swap. Uh, they'll be regulated by the CFTC, the Commodities Future Trading Commission out of the United States. And uh, and we'll see where it goes from there. I think they're going after price discovery uh, because right now price discovery happens on tons of different exchanges all over the world. A lot of them run on these stable coins like Tether that uh, are questionable. And so, you know, whether it's BitMEX or Bitfinex or... You know, th this is just all happening on unregulated, unlicensed exchanges in many different jurisdictions. And so large institutional investors don't really have a way to play Bitcoin. And BACT is going to give them a very safe, regulated solution for doing that. And if we see price discovery move from the BitMEXs and BitFinexes of the world to the BACs of the world, you know, because BACT is not the only one. There's Ledger X, which is currently operating, and they have next day swaps and they have Bitcoin derivatives, so puts and calls. And they're a swap execution facility and a derivatives clearing organization <clears throat> regulated by the CFTC. So, I mean, this is where the biggest players play. You have to be an ECP, an eligible contract participant, to have an account. A minimum, by federal statute, a minimum requirement is $10 million of investable assets. And then as a DCO, they have to have $25 million of equity to guarantee trades and clearing. Uh, so, you know, Ledger X is already operational and has been for about a year. BACT is getting into the game. Eris Exchange is going to get into the game. And then Truax is also going to get into the game. And so we're going to see some major developments in terms of Bitcoin's price discovery and that first speculation network effect. Uh, and so it's an incredibly exciting time to be involved. Yeah, I think custodian uh, services are, it's probably the biggest improvement in terms of how mass adoption can happen uh, that Bitcoin has seen. Do you think, Trace, uh, that the entrance of big banks as well, Fidelity is coming in, the brokerage firm City, uh, they're all introducing um, Bitcoin you know, services, trading services. So we're, we're not even talking about the ETFs. Do you think that this is a natural and important progression? Yeah, this is all part of an internet protocol taking root. Like, you know, when you sent the first emails and nobody had email accounts, like, you know, what was the value of SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol? But as more and more companies started adopting it, as more and more services like AOL and Prodigy and such got rolled out and, and mass, you know, the masses got access to email, you know, Pretty soon, eventually, email became just an entrenched protocol that everybody used uh, and everybody still uses. Email is a vastly inferior protocol compared to what we could build today, but because it already has these network effects, it's not really going anywhere. You know, And so we have to deal with bugs like spam and stuff like that, but it just kind of is what it is. And with Bitcoin... You know, we're going to see the same type of thing happen. It has the network effects. It has Bitcoin derivatives being traded on it right now, regulated by the CFTC. 
there is no other coin that even comes close in terms of the seven network effects that I originally introduced and, and helped the entire industry understand. Like, this is how adoption is going to take place. And sure enough, this is how adoption is taking place. And it's, you know, this is, this just makes Bitcoin that much more substantive, both economically, socially, politically, geopolitically, all of these things, you know, all these network effects just make Bitcoin more and more of a force uh, of nature in and of itself. Now, I want to ask you, are you surprised by this year's trading pattern? Um, in, in, a, in an interview earlier this year, um, you know, you, you talked about Bitcoin perhaps at 115000 per coin. Um, so how has 2018 surprised you? And how has 2018, um, you know, came to to be sort of within the range of expectations that, that you've had? Yeah, so, you know, if we go back and look at the Bitcoin mayor multiple, and I didn't coin the term, I wouldn't really do something like that. Uh, but you can learn a lot more at mayormultiple.com, and there's a lot of different resources out there. Uh, that that help in terms of charts and graphs with this thing. I think mayormultiple.info is another one. Um, yeah, I haven't made these sites, but what what I look at is I take the current price divided by the 200-day moving average, and that gives a relative price. And then you can plot that relative price over time. And what I like about this is that it helps us understand the relationship of different assets. And so we can see, based on standard deviations, when things are cheap and when they're expensive relative to past price discovery. And so Bitcoin, for example, uh, is trading at 0 0.9 its 200-day moving average, approximately. It's done this only 25% of the time in the past, a little bit less. And so statistically, now is a great time to buy Bitcoin. Assuming you like the fundamental thesis, because it's cheap, you know, relative to its statistical trading pattern. Now, $115,000, that's definitely within the realm of possibility. But what the mayor multiple helps us understand is where things are probable. So we have possibility and then we have probability. And if we use things like the mayor multiple, then we can get a higher probability for our future price discovery in the future, which can be helpful if you're trading on things like Bact or Ledger X, where you're trading Bitcoin derivatives, because this helps you sell covered calls, bring in income, not lose the underlying, uh, or buy puts to protect your position, uh, et cetera. Okay, very interesting. Now, look, this is a question that... Uh, has been on my mind for a very long time with regards to Bitcoin and it has to do with like the, the paradox of it or <clears throat> I would say the complexity of it so on one hand um, if you hold Bitcoin and do nothing with it it has no utility to you other than the fact that it is the, a way to retain purchasing power on the flip side if you use it as a medium of exchange another one of its uh, uses, utilities, uh, you know, benefits, then you're actually forfeiting the asset. You're, you're sending money to someone else with Bitcoin. In other words, you're shrinking your Bitcoin position. So could you talk about the fact of, or, or your opinion with regards to whether or not holding it or trading it is where the Bitcoin community is going and how does an investor or a trader or a user uh, needs to think about Bitcoin in in terms of this. <clears throat> yeah, so we've got the seven network effects. Speculation, merchants, consumers, security, financialization, and uh, developers, financialization, and then settlement currency, world reserve settlement currency status. Uh, speculation's where it, where it all starts. You know, Satoshi even said, hey, you might want to get some of this in case it catches on. Well, guess what? It's caught on in a big way. It's gone from like, I think, a penny when he said that to $6,000, right? Like, that's monstrous. So there's an aspect of buying Bitcoin with the future expectation that it might increase in value relative to other assets. Uh, this is, you know, this is just speculation. Uh, but what it helps people speculate on 
is what is the risk-free asset? What's the asset with, with the lowest risk profile? And when you're looking at risk, there's exchange rate risk, but there's also counterparty risk, uh, performance risk. If you're dealing with trusted third parties like a Federal Reserve or a bank, there's uh, financial risk in terms of the counterparty being able to uh, make good on the on the debt if if it's a debt instrument like a T bill or Apple shares or whatever. So you have to really look at like what is the risk free asset, and you want the assets that that's the most saleable, the most liquid. So you know it's gonna want you're gonna want to have these principles of money like divisibility, fungibility, durability, portability, and Bitcoin. You know hits on a lot of these, and so. When we're looking at, at, at our presentation currency under international financial regulations or international accounting standards, uh, IAS 24 and IAS 1 talk about a presentation currency. Like what do you measure your, your success uh, financially in? Do you measure it in dollars, in shekels, in British pounds, in gold ounces, in bitcoins? You know, and so I would argue that the world is rethinking what money is. It's rethinking what the lowest risk profile asset is and it's and the risk free rate. And Bitcoin is the hardest money in the world. You can't make more of it no matter what the price is. The difficulty adjustment algorithm is what it is. And then it's decentralized and and distributed and censorship resistant. And then individuals can hold their own private keys. And for 10 cents, they can verify the quantity and the quality of the Bitcoins with 100% accuracy. There's no melting down gold bars and recasting them or, or moving them across the planet. I mean, that's a very expensive thing to do uh, to, you know, in order to verify, you know, because don't trust, verify. That's a critical credo for people who want to have the risk-free asset. And so Bitcoin, you know, fulfills a lot of these these characteristics. And so when you're looking at dollars, you know, those are automatically ruled out as a potential risk free asset because you have to hold them with a centralized third party uh, and third parties are security holes. So you're subject to performance risk, counterparty risk, all this stuff. So like, why trust that? Why trust them uh, and bailouts and all of this stuff? And it's not limited in amount quantitative easing, easing, all of this stuff. Okay, so then we look at gold. Well, I already talked about some of its problems. And then we have Bitcoin. And so Bitcoin, if it is the risk-free asset, what you have to do is you have to reorient your entire paradigm. And you have to look at everything else from the vantage point of Bitcoin and price everything in Bitcoins. And when the price of, of Bitcoin goes up or down, because it's a sterile asset, it's not generating cash flows like a piece of land or, or dividends or stuff like that. When the price goes up, it actually transfers wealth from some other assets to the holders of Bitcoins. And so, you know, when you're, when you're looking at and, – and so this all goes into what is speculation demand, you know, and speculation demand is – People thinking that Bitcoin may be worth more in the future or they're holding it because of that store of value thesis. And I would add that there is a there is a slice of demand that looks like speculation demand, but is actually more a form of insurance. And there was a there was a study, a survey put out in, in England, and they found that 33 percent of companies across the board, whether they were really small or 500 plus employees that they held a, a significant amount of Bitcoin for uh, encryption uh, attacks, basically like hackers that have ransomware. And so that's a form of insurance where people are holding Bitcoin, but they're not necessarily doing it for the utility of getting a price increase, but they're doing it for the utility that they can decrypt their database, like a hospital or whatever, in case it gets hit with ransomware. But that all kind of looks like speculation demand. So that's the speculation demand. Then, because Bitcoin's fixed and limited in an amount with the difficulty adjustment algorithm, we've only got one other part of the of the equation, and that's transactional demand. And that's the question that you're asking about with people using it to buy things. 
And every individual has to go through a comparative goods analysis. Everybody does it instinctually. They value this apple more than they value a British pound, and they value the British pound more than they value a movie ticket or whatever, right? And but you know, sometimes having a lot of Bitcoin, you're you're gonna want to spend it because you have to eat. You know, you can't keep all of your money in it and not eat. I I mean or you might think it's overvalued and so you want that Lamborghini or whatever the thing is, right? And so that transactional demand, uh, that's where people shift from speculation demand to the transactional demand. And or, or maybe you're just using it to transfer value over a communications protocol, which, as Satoshi said, is kind of Bitcoin's distinguishing characteristic. We've made data scarce and limited in amount and valuable, right? And so maybe you want to transfer value into the gambling company because doing so with a credit card or whatever is otherwise just very costly and takes a lot of time and very annoying and et cetera. Well, that transactional demand, the price elasticity of it does not care what the price of Bitcoin is. Whether Bitcoin's five cents or $5,000 it transfers that value equally well over the communications protocol. And so with prices set at the edges by transactional demand, it can get crazy with the Bitcoin price because it's strictly limited in amount. And so as soon as speculation demand moves up appreciably or there's a, a shock to that supply, then the price has to go up tremendously or go down tremendously in order to uh, kind of fill – market demand. And so that's why we get these crazy cycles with Bitcoin. So I, you know, long answer, but, you know, it's, there's a lot going on uh, with that question. Sure. And I think it's a very important question because people want to know in the end, hey, where is this going? Where is this protocol going? Where is this community going? Um, and how will this look like in, uh, you know, in, in two to three to four to five to 20 years? Um, and, and with that in mind, you know, one of the big obstacles, one of the big scares of 2018 where people are saying, hey, this this entire thing scares me, is regulations. And I want to ask you, is that a critical juncture going forward to set the regulations straight on this entire community? Well, as I've already talked about with Ledger X already operating for a year, backed, Eris Exchange, Truex, the regulation is, you know, the big boys – it's been cleared out of the way. They're coming in. It's just a matter of time. And as that happens, you know, 5, 10, 20, 50 years out, where is Bitcoin going to be? Well, we're talking about network effects. We're talking about new World Reserve Settlement currency. We're talking about usage in consumer application like Starbucks and Microsoft and stuff like that. And... <coughs> merchants being able to hedge the exchange rate risk with these Bitcoin derivatives. You know, this is this is where all of this stuff is hitting the road in a very big way. And it's incredibly exciting, you know, because we get self-determination in all of this. It's not like it's not like the currency is just going to collapse overnight, like with Argentine pesos or Venezuelan bolivars. No, People get to willingly choose to be part of the greatest wealth transfer that the world has ever seen. We've got a new money, a hardest money in the world that appears to be outcompeting all the other competitors in the boxing ring. And so if you have it, guess what? Profits go to those people who calculate correctly economically. Losses go to those people who calculate incorrectly. And Bitcoin is being absolutely brutal in allocating those gains and losses in a totally dispassionate, non-politicized, completely peaceful and censorship resistant way. Now, I want to ask you last, uh, you know, 2017, everyone was saying, hey, this is the most volatile asset class ever. This thing goes up or down 7% a day on average. Now... 2018, I mean, look at the last two months. This is boring, right? It stays over, uh, uh, you know, 6,300, 6,400, 6,500. It's like a brick. So that definition of being a volatile asset class is, is, is nothing that defines Bitcoin anymore. And so, you know, tell us a little bit. It, it's amazing, right? Like 
2017, everyone was saying, hey, this is the most volatile asset class we've ever seen. And right now, people who are watching this for like two, three months are saying, man, this is like a brick. It's just not moving. Zero volatility. And so the neither definition is really good for it. Now, in terms of uh, how it fares, I mean, in 2017, this was the most outrageously good year for any asset class that I've seen in the last 100, 150 years. Who knows uh, how long, um, you know, <laughs> how long we haven't seen something as radical and profitable as uh, cryptocurrencies were last year. And now look at Bitcoin right now when uh, the general markets are correcting and Bitcoin stays put. So you, can you talk a little bit about um, how this has all changed? How this asset class has moved from uh, you know sexy and all the time in the news to boring, no one mentioning it? Well... Yes, the Bitcoin volatility is at its lowest point in, you know, several years, but it's still like 57. I mean, this is still a highly volatile asset class. Make no mistake about it. Uh, it's only a, what, $115 billion uh, total market cap. I mean, this is tiny compared to world markets, especially other currencies. I think part of it is, you know, we talked about this speculation demand and how it just gets crazy, especially as any type of demand, uh, news media, stuff like that stimulates it. But what really, really makes the difference are the, the, the people or institutions that I've coined the term hodler of last resort. These are the people that will hold Bitcoin no matter what happens. They will never exit their Bitcoin position, period. You know, and this is uh, these are the hodlers of last resort. And in a day and age where we've had plunge protection team, the president's working group on financial markets manipulating markets, when we have quantitative easing that's manipulating the the currency, which impacts everything else that happens in the economy, where we have huge amounts of passive investing with mutual funds and things like Wealthfront, where we have Robinhood selling the data to high-frequency traders, where we don't even have a standard numeraire that makes any sense intelligibly. Dollar? What's that? Give me a definition. Oh, you wait, you can't. And even in federal law, it's unintelligible. 50 ounces of silver equals one ounce of gold, which equals Federal Reserve notes. On the periodic table, that doesn't make any sense at all. It's unintelligible. And then we have gold. And so with Bitcoin, you're able to take territory on the blockchain that is strictly limited in amount. You, We now have a tool to measure by. We can measure everything else with it. We've got something that's totally fixed, right? Like this is a huge deal. And so are you increasing your territory on that blockchain or not? Becomes the question for the hodler of last resort. And so the hodlers of last resort, <clears throat> what are they doing, doing during times like this? Well, they're converting value, whether it's their time working at their job or their business, whether it's other assets, they're converting that value into territory on the blockchain and they're taking it as a hodler of last resort. And I think that's what we're seeing. We're probably seeing some institutions that are establishing a Bitcoin position. Why? So that they can trade it with futures or options or other things like this. But first they have to establish the position. Uh, and then they can, you know, they can start doing other stuff with it. And so that I think might be a reason why we're just seeing a lot of strength at like six thousand dollars of Bitcoin. But guess what? It could break down another level. It could go down to three or four thousand. Whenever we have a crypto winter like this, the longer and the more brutal the winter, the better I think it is because the hodlers of last resort that come out of it, they just have solid hands and they become like a mountain they're not going anywhere right and they've accumulated a new position of bitcoin at a new all-time high in terms of like the three thousand dollars because the pre previous high was thirteen hundred dollars so bitcoin keeps going up you know every every 
four years, it seems like, with the difficulty adjustment algorithm uh, reducing the supply of Bitcoin, giving a supply shock. Uh, and then, you know, as we have media frenzy and stuff like that. So so I'm not the least bit worried about Bitcoin and its perceived stability because, you know, so many people are just get rich quick here, there, gone tomorrow. They're not hodlers of last resort. And those people don't really matter that much. It's the hodlers of last resort that really matter. They're the ones that give the economic substance to assets. And guess what? They're in here buying at these all-time lows in terms of volatility, in terms of price, in terms of all of this stuff. Because they believe in the fundamental thesis that I've laid out with these seven network effects, and they're putting their money where their mouth is. And they're either going to be correct or incorrect. If they're correct, they're going to have gains. If they're incorrect, they're going to have losses. And same with everybody else is participating in all of these global markets for all of these different assets. Now, Trace, could you talk a little bit about what you're doing today? Where can people find more of your work, everything like that? Just update us. Yeah, so I'm actually uh, trading uh, quite a bit on Ledger X. I'm finding a lot of fun with it. Uh, I think part of the reason the volatility has declined is because of the, the futures markets are starting to develop, and so we can get some price discovery in the future. And it's a great place for hodlers of last resort because, you know, you can sell volatility. For example, you know, sold some people the right to buy Bitcoin at $50,000 of Bitcoin in December of 2018, and they paid pretty good chunk of premium for that option. So if people want to establish a Bitcoin position, they're going to have to pay the hodlers very richly to do so. Uh, so that's kind of what I've been up to a lot. Uh, additionally, I've got my Twitter, at Trace Mayer, and uh, my Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, where I interview the top people in the Bitcoin space uh, at Bitcoin.kn. Uh, so that's where people can learn more and kind of follow, follow the stuff that uh, I'm up to. Trace, last question. Uh, uh, talk a little bit about what what happened in the last uh, two conferences over there in Vegas, where where everything is happening right now. Oh yeah, so we had a couple conferences in Vegas with uh, Money 2020 and Coin Agenda, and um, and I think World CryptoCon is the other one. And so you know what we're finding is that there is a core community in Bitcoin of hodlers of last resort. And that core is growing in size. It's growing in the number of people. It's growing in the professionalism. And it's growing in terms of its economic mass and substance. And, and as you are in the space developing human capital, learning how to buy and sell Bitcoin, send it around, building businesses, establishing relationships with people. You know, this, this is all human capital that gives you optionality to participate in future things uh, with regard to Bitcoin. And so, you know, that's what we're seeing at a lot of these conferences. And it's, uh, and it's a very exciting thing uh, because the community is just growing huge. I mean, in terms of size, given the, the winter and everything, I would think more people would have been frozen out and, and died and gone to some other industry or, or chased some other thing. But nope, here they are sticking to it with Bitcoin, becoming hodlers of last resort. I think that's an important uh, thing for this community, for sure, to have people that are very, very uh, long-term oriented. You know, it reminds me kind of uh, what happened with uh, Warren Buffett like in 1998. And uh, Bill Hackman, a huge uh, hedge fund manager uh, in Wall Street, asked him, is he happy with Coca-Cola's management buying back stock in 1998 when the P-E ratios were insanely high, right? And Warren says to him, look, what do you think the intrinsic value of Coca-Cola is? If you think that we've reached the ultimate top, then no, it's not a good idea. But hey, if it's undervalued compared to where it would be for me as a long-term shareholder of Coca-Cola, I like them buying back stock right now because it means that I'll own more of it tax-free in the future. And I think that is uh, playing to the point of what you're saying. 
if if the price is dropping and there are people that are accumulating the right, then um, this is going to be a big, big windfall of profits for them. Um, Trace, I really want to thank you for coming on the show. Absolutely great interview for everyone who uh, who listens to this. And um, uh, until next time. Yep. Thanks so much for having me, Lior. And uh, we'll do it again.